We recorded this episode of School of War at a live event last week for Edward Lutbach, a strategist and author and longtime iconoclastic fixture of debates in Washington about defense policy and strategy. The event was about his new book, which is about the Israeli Defense Forces and their impressive capacity for innovation. And we had it on the calendar well before war in southern Israel broke out. So obviously, we discussed the war too. Let's get into it. It is a prescription for war, this Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. We continue to face a grave situation in Iran. The We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall never surrender. For maps, videos, and images, follow us on Instagram, and also feel free to follow me on Twitter at Aaron B. McLean. Welcome, everybody. My name is Aaron McLean. It is a great delight to welcome tonight Dr. Edward Lutbeck. I, I have elements of his bio written down here. We could, and I've, I've seen this happen, we could go all night unpacking and exploring different aspects of the bio. He is a contractual strategic consultant for the United States government. He's the author of numerous books. I'll just name a few that, that I personally have learned from. Grand Strategy of the Roman Empire, Coup d'etat, a handbook. It's a book on strategy itself. The Rise of China versus the Logic of Strategy. There's a book from 1975 on the IDF, yes. Aftermath of the 73 War. And then tonight, we, of course, are gathered here to celebrate and talk about the appearance of the Art of Military Innovation Lessons from the IDF. So please join me in thanking Thank Dr. You. Litvak for joining us tonight. Just one, one more note before I, I, I turn it over to Edward here to, um, to, to start by talking a bit about the war. I, I came to Edward's work a little bit later in my, in my career so far, and it was, it was 2016. So you have you know Trump and you have Brexit and all this kind of stuff going on. And I saw on Twitter, what was then Twitter, someone tweet an article by Edward it was about right-wing populism. And my, re my immediate response was, well, okay, tell me something I, I don't know. It's hardly breaking news in 2016 that right-wing populism is, uh, is alive and well. And then I looked at the date on the article, which appeared in the London Review of Books. It was 1994. And that really was, I think, a bold prediction in 1994. And Edward has a, a record of bold predictions that turn out essentially to be accurate. So with that, you know, we're going to we're going to talk about your book, sir, obviously. But before we get to that, your, your book is about how the IDF is this source of innovation to be to be imitated. And I'm curious, just I'll start you with this question. In the aftermath of October 7th, you know, what what role, what share of the responsibility does the IDF bear amongst other elements of the state? How do you account for that? And uh, how's the IDF doing now? Well, the book is not about. Israeli military history or what they did in the past or the present, and the book is strictly about research and development. It's, it's about why you can develop a system like Iron Dome, which is a perfectly normal radar, perfectly normal software, an interceptor, which is a bit cheap, but otherwise perfectly normal, except to do it in four years. If you do it in four years, you do now have to do what we do with weapon system development, which is that you have to, you, you work for five years and then you have to stop because all the microprocessors have changed. You go backtrack, then you go forward again, then you go sideways and so on. So the Israeli method of development is high speed development. It's a different method. That's what the book really is about. And how they are not trying to absolutely minimize waste, fraud, or so on, even mismanagement at all, what they're trying to do is to get a weapon system developed quickly so that you put it in a field and you can start improving it instead of being in an ever, never ending thing. And one. Secondly, the other thing is that they're willing to learn from others. For example, the heart of the F-35 is the so-called helmet mounted display, which is, as those, I'm sure you know, is not a helmet mounted display at all. It means simply you put this thing on your head and you can see below your aircraft because there are all these visuals outside, so sideways, you can see back, forward, and you can direct a missile by looking at the target and signaling, and the missile head turns so that the missile gets launched right off the airplane without waiting those long minutes before the whole airplane turns and all that stuff. All of these 
where did they get this from? They got it because it, when the East German government collapsed, the West German Air Force inherited some MiG-29s. The Israelis knew that the Syrians are getting MiG-29s. So they were very, very anxious to go. The Germans were very nice to let them go into this airplane. The first thing they saw, there was a helmet mounted to display. It wasn't the two and a half million dollar splendiferous technicolor, beautifully painted thing, but it was that thing. And they immediately, frantically tried, started to copy it. And they developed it and for their own sound. And the US Air Force in the meantime, even though the army had such helmets, for the helicopters, the Air Force couldn't care less. And also, the Israelis reported that the MiG-29 is a fantastic aeroplane. It's an interceptor. It goes right up. It will shoot things down and so on. The, I read the whole U.S. report on the MiG-29, U.S. Air Force report. Well, the paint wasn't very good. Secondly, the radar screen was dim. And then they pointed out, of course, it doesn't have long range because the engine drinks a lot. But it's an interceptor, so it's not supposed to have long range unless the plane is defecting. You know, it's supposed to get off <laughs> and shoot down a bomber. The report was not an attempt to find out about Soviet technology. It was to explain why Soviet technology is a rubbish, okay? So that's the difference, okay? And, and so it's high-speed development, willing to learn around, and open door. There are two footnotes in the book about open door me, okay? One is when I was visiting, I was a tourist, basically. 1970, I was a tourist and they lost an RF-4, a two-seater, two-engine Phantom to take pictures across the canal. So I went, immediately went to the Ministry of Defense to see the chief scientist and to tell him that in Switzerland, my rich relatives in Switzerland had just bought an airplane for their kid that could fly 50 kilometers, and you could put the dangle camera on it. So who did I tell this to? Well, the chief scientist, who was a mathematician, called the Rusky. How do I get to see him? I went to the guard outside, the guy, keep it, you know, the soldier outside, and I said, I want to talk to the chief scientist. He said, why do you want to talk to the chief scientist? So I'm not telling you, because it's a secret. <laughs> and so the guy picks up the phone, calls the office, chief scientist says, come right upstairs. Okay, that happened when I was a kid, a long time ago. Then, four years ago, I was in Israel on holiday with my wife, and I got, uh, they invited me to do a, to go and visit the Hezbollah village built on the side of Mount Carmel, which is a full reproduction containing all the rockets, everything. And I said, how, how do you get into the tunnels here? And the guy says, oh, well, Sayerita goes, you know, specialized unit. You put ropes under the arms. We're going to lower him into the thing. He has an Uzi, he'll shoot. And I said, forget it. I said, the way to do it is to drill holes there. We're using RPGs. The, the Russian makes wonderful RPGs. They're very cheap. And all we take is an M113, which is this boxy, useless troop carrier. The Israelis have thousands of them, and they're selling them online, by the way. Or were. <laughs> How much? I'm, I don't know. But they, <laughs> they, they were getting rid of them. I said, we take this, we put the Marlboro box, a Marlboro cigarette-type magazine in the back, and a little arm to pull them out, dangle them to get things, and we start drilling holes. We don't know where the tunnels are, but the, the fact is the villages are quite compact. They're between the houses. These things are very cheap, let's do it, and so on. Again, I was, I was there on a, on a family thing. I, I see this thing on Mount Carmel. I tell these thoughts of mine to the brief, to the escorting officer who was a, a general purpose, Lieutenant Colonel, Infantry Reserve. And next morning, people showed up at the hotel. They said, and by that night, I met the head of R&D command. In other words, open door, open door, okay? People have ideas, listen to them. Open door is very important. And, the, and in this country, open door would do much more. There is no open door. And a final thing about R&D. It's very good that there's economic constraint, that you don't have all the money in the world. And you are a Marine, right? Mm -hmm. So the Marines, Berger, the commander of the Marine Corps, desperately wanted to get many more landing things, landing call them landing craft, okay? Many more landing craft, and because it's distributed strategy to be able to tackle this them distributed islands the Chinese have. So. so it goes to NAFC, Naval Sea Systems Command, because Marine Corps do not have any zero, the, the Navy doesn't let them develop anything. 
at all. They have to do that. So they go to NAFSI, and, and the Marines say, we want the smallest possible, simplest possible thing, and we want it next week. Okay? And it was called the Light Landing Craft, and they was advertised. They were very proud. They got the price down to $100 million. <laughs> it's a box. It's a steel box with an engine supposed to move people. Okay? I don't know why it cost $100 million, but they were proud instead of being ashamed. Well, <laughs> then what happens, NAFC looks at this thing, and it's called the Light Landing Craft for $100 million, and they started working on it, working on it. And Berger, Marine Corps commandant, found out that they were not going to do these boxes for him. They were going to start developing them, making them bigger and better. So he intervened. They told him to buzz off. It turns out the command of the Marine Corps, the only way he could impress on them would have been to take his sidearm and shoot them because <laughs> they pay no attention. And now the Navy proudly announces that in five years' time, there'll be the medium landing thing. The light one is dead. They have the medium one. And of course, instead of having 50, they're going to have four and so on. In other words, the, all those people who I see writing columns deploring the small size of the U.S. Navy, the thing to do is to go there to NAFC and shoot every second person <laughs> because they are responsible. They refuse. They, if it's an aircraft carrier, it can't be just a $7 billion aircraft carrier. It has to be $13 billion by putting on a letter. You know, they don't have this. They have the great poverty is great. Okay. Finally, a, a few other, a couple of other things. One is that I got, my, I got the information by talking to a lot of people. My co-author is a reserve officer, very just in R&D. He talked to a lot of people. Then he has students, graduate students at his university who went to research various things. And this is wonderful, let's call it normal research to find out things and so on. But then I got a wonderful resource. The wonderful resource is that Israel has a controller general. He has a, a person who makes sure that things get done properly, that there isn't mismanagement, there isn't waste and that procedures are followed. And so I read his report on the Iron Dome, and it's a catalog of absurd, uh, ridiculous, and enormous violations. The guy, this guy, Gold, his name is, the, the, who wanted the Iron Dome, he wanted to develop this in four years. Okay, four years. So he went to industry and said, I don't have actually a budget for this, because he only had R&D budget, but you know, there will be money, there will be money, because the politicians will understand that we have to have it. So all these different state, well, they're state companies, you know, they all started doing things. So the Comptroller General lists an endless series of violations of proper rules and procedures. If they had been followed, the Iron Dome would be t t now being tested out, mm -hmm. okay? And his catalog of violations of what the rule was and what they actually did tells you how to do R&D which is ignore the rules, do it, and that's what they actually do. So they have actually erected in Israel the same machinery of 5,003 regulations that burden the Defense Department, but they have an advantage. They don't respect it. <laughs> they violate it. <laughs> now, and less funny is what happened uh, there on October 7th, yeah. and two things happened. First, intelligence fell into the recurring Israeli delusion that there will be one day some Arab leadership that's actually interested in development. So they saw that Hamas wasn't launching rockets anymore. Hamas was tipping them off about Islamic Jihad rockets. And the, the, the Israelis were getting very good intelligence from their spies in Gaza and very good intelligence from Hamas. Indeed, when they went and, and hit something, that was uh, there was a nice explosion. That was Islamic Jihad. And, it was prevented from launching his rocket. So intelligence was deceived very skillfully by Hamas by feeding them intelligence, by not launching rockets, and by telling, hey, we have turned the corner, we want the people of Gaza to live well, we, and so on and so forth. And all that cement that went into the tunnels and so on, all came through Hashdot port, and it was paid for by Qatar, and everything is wonderful and so on. The recurrent delusion that there is an Arab leader somewhere who actually does what Portuguese leaders do, Norwegian leaders do, and, and you know, Haiti, Haiti and uh, be the exception, but even Curaçao leaders do and some, and which is to try and, you know, improve things a bit. Steal a little money, but also allow something to happen. So that was, that was the intelligence mistake. But the intelligence mistake 
is, was not sufficient for October 7th. You also had to have a military planner's mistake. And the military planner knows that the business of intelligence is called intentions, intentions. That's what they get from all their gossip. And there, the military planner has to deal with capabilities because intentions can change overnight. So the military planner should have ignored this optimistic intelligence, realized that Hamas could change his mind. Therefore, they should have had proper presence there. So you may have seen a film clip of the Hamas people jumping around the top of Merkava. That was a single tank. Before there was a troop, that was three tanks. Before there was a company, nine tanks. So military planners are always supposed to row against intelligence. If intelligence is, you know, they have to, they have to take, take into account the possibility that intelligence is being too optimistic. That's what they're paid for. And they didn't do it. They didn't do it at all because they had slimmed down all these presences. So, for example, the observation, all the observation was done by these observation towers, their points, and they were manned by a single soldier who happened to be a female, because females are supposed to be more attentive. A single girl, that's all there was. When Hamas attacked his tower, there was a single girl in there. Now, if you think that this is unusual, it's not. I was, in, I'm a very, very old guy, and I was in the 73 war. I crossed the canal, I had the best time, ate a lot of French cheese, because one of Eric Sharon's admirers sent a truckload of French cheese, which was stinking up our troop carriers, so we had to eat you know, <laughs> Brie and all that stuff, crossed the canal at a great time. But that war, how did that war start? They had 22 forts along the canal. These were not supposed to be real forts, but just outposts, you know, 22 outposts. Each outpost was supposed to be manned by, like, uh, let's say, a platoon. Let's call it 25 or something, not a full platoon. Well, when the Egyptians attacked with 20,000 people in the very first wave, there were 411 soldiers in 17 of these outposts. There was only one outpost that was fully manned up to stand, and it never fell. It never fell right through the war. All it had was, it had the platoon, instead of having four or five guys, and it resisted. So, in other words, if people go out and build the stake, they're going to be optimists. They're going to be optimists, and they're going to be risk takers. So what you had on October 7 was the comeuppance of Opt risk-taking optimists encountering Hamas, which, in, in, of course, it in, is a deep, you know, a, a fairly deeply perverted phenomenon because there are people who control the territory who don't give a damn about the territory. In fact, just the other day, somebody interviewed a Hamas person and said, "You have all these tunnels. How come you don't let people shelter from air attack in the tunnels?" So, no, no, the tunnels are for us. Uh, people, it's the UN that has to protect the people. In other words, they take no responsibility at all. That's Hamas. Behind Hamas is, of course, Iran. And the Tehran Times, my favorite newspaper today, <laughs> was saying, well, Hamas was only the start. This is just the start. We have the whole region. We have many possibilities to attack because we have the militias that we own in Iraq. We have, of course, Syria. And then, of course, the Houthis already launched a, a thing. And, and so on. And you know, and you can see how broadly, how very tolerant these people are. Because Hamas ideology is Sunni, uh, strictly Sunni, and according to them, the Shia are a heretic, and strict Sunnis really believe that it should be killed, you know. And the Islamic State acted on that. To somebody who did not know the Sunni form of prayer, they killed it on the side of the road. So but they are broad minded, these Iranians. They support Hamas, even though Hamas well, for example, Hamas would never let a Shia, if there were a Shia in Gaza, have a job like a teacher. In Egypt, there's a law against that. But Hamas would not let a Shia exist in Gaza, really. But they will support them. They're very liberal, you know, yeah, yeah. and all that. Houthis also. Houthis are nominally Shia, but they are not 12 birds, like the Iranians. They are, the, the Houthis are seveners, like the Ismailis. And yet, they're broad-minded. <laughs> of course, if you were in Iran as a seminar, you'd be in real trouble because you'd be a heretic. But they're very broad-minded, so they support the Houthis. In fact, in Yemen, they even support the Zaitis, who are fivers and so on. So the broad-minded Iranians, and we have to find a way of deterring them, like tomorrow. Yeah. Well, on that theme, let me ask you. Yeah. So that's... that's. But can I just say two words Please. about R&D? You, you can okay. say ten words. Research and development is 
uh, is not technology only. It's also, also about special units. And the special units, they have developed purpose-designed special units. And some of them are world famous, like 8,200 that generates people. Others are much less known. But they are also doing things of sort of some broader interest. For example, they have, they, uh, and autistic soldiers are recruited, and they serve in a specialized unit of intelligence. Turns out that autistic is actually very good for differentiating intelligence photographs and all that kind of stuff. But they have all kinds of, in other words, having, since you have to have an army, why not use that army to raise your whole population by education and so on, but also deal with problems like juvenile delinquency. They have units, they don't put them in normal units, units of juvenile delinquents that they socialize, socialize, and some of whom and, uh, emerge from these units good enough to go into office school and become officers. So it's, it's you know, it, it, it's, it's about the fact that, okay, you have to have an army. People have to serve three years. Well, three years is a long time. That means you can really elevate the population by injecting a lot of education and so on, and that's in the book as well. How do you evaluate both the strategy that's been pursued since October the 7th, which of course ultimately is the government's responsibility, but also how do you evaluate operational progress in Gaza? How's the IDF doing? Right, so the, the, the purpose of the strategy is to actually find as many Hamas leaders as possible and kill them. Every day they find new ones, they publish their photographs, their names and their functions. And how do you find these people? By attacking headquarters. The headquarters are not, you know, large headquarters, they're small outfits in different places, they're in tunnels and so on. How do you locate those those headquarters? You locate them among other things because of the of the fact that that the October seven attack, which people compared to the Holocaust, was nothing like the Holocaust, because they found more than a thousand dead Hamas people who had been killed by householders, villagers, people there with their handguns, with their rifles, and so on. And on them, they found a lot of documents. Strangely enough, they were carrying documents. First thing you do when you're going to combat, you empty your pocket. They didn't uh, empty their pockets. Hmm. They didn't have elaborate manuals or something like that, but they had actually things like go to here, you know, little memo chits and things like that. So they're able to process that intelligence. Communication intercepts give you something. And then, of course, the other thing is that from the moment the operation started, Arabic speaking, Arabic speaking Israeli soldiers have entered individually dressed as locals of different kinds, you know. They're in Han Yunis, they say they are from Jabalia. They are in Jabalia, they say from Han Yunis. And they've been going in and doing things like volunteering, you know, volunteering. And so, oh, well, you want to volunteer, go there and so on. So I've been getting a lot of intel to locate these headquarters or these leaders or these hangouts, whatever they are. And that's what they're doing. They're not trying to find hostages. They're not trying to find the very top leaders who, of course, I mean, the topist is in Qatar. They could easily find him. In fact, they should find him. But they, I hope they don't just kill him with a shot. You know, it's too easy and so on. <laughs> Something more imaginative, you know. And, but the aim is to destroy the cadres, cadres, you know. Find uh, cadres. And along the way, when you approach one of those situations, there might be a couple of people who are protecting them. So they get rid of them. So it's basically getting rid of people. And then... Since these people are in tunnels or nearby, then you identify tunnels, and when you finish with the tunnel, of course, you destroy the tunnel. Now, most, uh, all of the rockets are produced in tunnels. The materials thereof are held in tunnels, and so until you destroy the tunnel system, a very large part, they can continue to make, assemble, and launch rockets, because at the end of this tunnel, you turn right, and then there's a hole above, and you just launch a rocket. So that's what the operation is. It's strictly detail, detail operation. It's infantry. And the Israelis are doing it at the pace. And what they're not doing is to do, you know, rushing forward sure. and so on. Because among other things, every one of the tunnels so far entered was booby-trapped. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about the pace then. I mean, I, I find myself worried. I assume a lot of folks in the room are worried because there is a window, I think, internationally 
that will ultimately close in terms of sympathy for the Israeli cause, in terms of American support, this administration's support, I should be more specific, uh, for what Israel is doing. You already hear calls for a pause, which there's no such thing as a pause, just a temporary ceasefire. So there are already calls for ceasefires. The deliberate pace may have very good operational justification, as you right. just cited. But it's, you know, you, your book is about the sort of spirit of, of innovation and daring and surprise. Whatever is happening right now seems sort of linear and deliberate. Right. Okay. So they, they, are, they are looking at the clock, okay? For example, they can accommodate the pauses, no end of pauses, by simply making them localized. We have a localized pause here for you to do this, like you remove people, or to, you know, bring supplies to a hospital. They can do localized pauses. They, this is not a World War II air bombardment of vast areas. This is a single targeted bombing, so they can accommodate the pauses. That's what they figure out they can do. As for deliberation, the deliberation is, they're not deliberate in the sense of, you know, World War II, let's postpone D-Day by a, a year, you know, so we're better prepared. We're talking about deliberation, about sort of running in versus rushing in, you know, and they are losing soldiers along the way. They know they're going to lose soldiers. This war will not be fought without losing soldiers. But uh, what my understanding is that they, they as soon as, as uh, President Biden talked about pauses, that was their solution, localized pauses. That's how you manage it. Now, as for losing support, the way to gain support is to be a victim. So I'm afraid there's a limit to how much you prioritize, you know, having support. You're willing to go without support, lose support along the way. And so, but so far, interestingly enough, support has been maintained much more than anybody could have expected from a range of European governments. The only European leader I've talked to is Meloni, who is an old friend of mine, as it happens. I asked Meloni, I said, Meloni, when will the pressure on you be that you have to switch and start deploring what's going on and says, says only the church is bothering me. I don't care about them of the far left. I don't care, of course. You know, the carabinieri can deal with them if they assemble. <laughs> but the church bothers me all the time. The church, you know, the church really loves Palestinians, it turns out. So, uh, but she is not the church goer. Hmm. You know, I mean, you know, she's a woman who has a child, who never bothered to marry. So, they picked the wrong prime minister from that point of view in there. The German, on the other hand, as you know, uh, the very interesting that the, the German left is the one aggressive on Ukraine, and so on, but they're, they're holding. For the time being, there's more time, more okay. time. And they are trading off how many soldiers you lose versus how much time, and I think they're trying to trade this off every single day. So I'm, I'm conscious of our time. I'm going to ask you a question or two about the book and the IDF more broadly, and then we'll see if we have a few minutes if anyone in the audience uh, has a question. So this question comes from, from, from the Marine in me. I feel compelled to ask this question. In the, in the book, you talk about, I believe it's Moshe Dayan visiting the White House and observing a Marine review, a ceremonial, probably Marines from yeah, Vietnam. Uh, right, right. And he comments, and you record in the book, that he feels in some ways offended that you have these you know fine fighting men being used as sort of marionettes. Are you sure it was the Marines and it wasn't the ceremonial guys? Promise it. Well, there are ceremonial Marines. Yeah, well, you also have the 3rd Infantry no, from the yeah, Army. Uh, Let's same, same applies no, right, if it's the 3rd no, right. Infantry. Same, point, same principle. Yeah. That these fine fighting men are being used for performance as marionettes, and this is not how we fight. We don't fight in formation like this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all well and good. And I confess the times I've been around the IDF, uh, all after my Marine career, the informality of the IDF, which you, you make a strong case for in the book, makes me uncomfortable. And, and the case you would make for the kind of very visible performance of discipline you see in a place like the Marines or certain units of the U.S. Army is, here, I'll make, I'll make a 15-second version of it. Standing post is one of the hardest things any soldier will ever do because the most, most of the time you stand post, nothing will ever happen. You might go years. You might go a whole career with nothing ever significant happening as you stand guard. And yet, when something does happen, You'll have seconds, maybe a fraction of a second to react, which requires extraordinary vigilance. Vigilance, excuse me. And how do you generate that vigilance without the kind of culture that's created at a place like, say, Paris Island? How how does the does the IDF, for all that it gains from this culture of discussion and debate and uh, everything that there are clearly virtues to, are there are there also drawbacks to it? The, you know, at the end of the book, I actually have an eyewitness 
involving Beirut, 1982. I was in Beirut, 1982, and I, I was actually visiting a friend of mine who was there, uh, one of the units, and some, uh, some, suddenly I see a group of Marines who have landed there. They've landed there because Camp Weinberger wanted the Israelis out, and he, and he didn't want any cooperation at all between Marines and Israelis because that was the whole idea mm. politically and so on. So there's this Marine lieutenant and some other guy. They're looking for an Israeli officer because they were just trying to liaise. They just arrived. And I look around and I see the Israeli officer. He's sitting on the ground with his soldiers, with his back against the wall, and he's eating out of a can, using the can opener with everyone as a spoon. He has no thing. Mm-hmm. And, and he's got, his hair is wild, he's unshaven, and his uniform is you know all messed up, just like his soldiers. So the Marines, they, they, I could see on their face their disgust at the idea that an officer is sitting <laughs> on the ground eating out of a can. And stuff. The nice thing that happened is that there was some shooting started. So immediately these guys got up in, in a tactical pose all around the officer. They're all alert. They hold their weapon, and they're ready to do it. So the Marines went through both, and I mentioned this because I asked them, I, I said, I said, you were disgusted when you saw these guys sitting with their backs and against the wall completely like that, uh, making no attempt to, and so on. But they're tactically responsible. The, the mess and the mess and, and the outward indiscipline and all that are all part of an unseparable culture. And I read, read the conclusion. I write about it because I got some fantastically good data. There was a, a reserve unit which specialized in getting people who had served in foreign armies. And so this officer commanding interviewed these people about the Israeli army. And all of them agreed they'd never been in their lives in such an absolutely messy, confused, disorganized, chaotic organization like the Israeli army. And then one of them got up and said, you know, I was the South African army. And as we were, every time we were moving into Angola, every night we stopped, we established a camp. The camp was right, all arranged, a line that we painted in white, the entrances and so on. And it took us six months to realize that the insurgents were using our self-delineation and so on. So in other words, the, you cannot separate mm-hmm. the dynamic. You, you cannot take that and get the other. You, you have to make a choice. Yeah. You have to make a choice. And, but this marine problem was raised in Israel a long time ago by the commandant general of the tank force, General Talik, who absolutely believed that if there's no outward discipline, there is no inward discipline. And that lack of inward discipline manifested itself in the poor maintenance of armored vehicles that need very specific, very careful maintenance. So he instituted in the armor corps the absolutely per uniform check, drills, saluting, the whole thing in the Armored Corps, and he coexisted with the others yeah. there. So they're, they, they're aware of this, because you, one of the strands in the Israeli army was the people who served in the British army. Yeah. You know, and they, General Child made the, the army, if you join the Armored Corps, you had to have clean boots, okay? <laughs> and the shining boots. And then they, they, in other words, they're aware of it, they do it. However, you, well, you cannot, even if it were a superior model, you couldn't apply it. Yeah. Final question for me, and then we'll take one or two from, from the team here. You talk about this concept of a, of a macro innovation, and you talk about how the Israeli oh, yeah. complex allows for, the, the sort of military-industrial right. complex unique to Israel allows for these macro innovations. And this ties into topics you've been writing about your whole career and how strategy works. Just what is a macro innovation? Okay. You, have an, you, you go into a building, and it says research and development. They have a budget. And you ask them, what are you doing? And what they're doing is they're taking an existing configuration, an existing weapon system, and let's make it better. Okay? So when you take an existing configuration and make it better, several things happen. One of them is that that platform, that system, that, you know, that the parameters thereof already block off all kinds of innovations because they don't fit the platform. You can't do something revolutionary and you end, up, you, you end up spending a lot of money to upgrade the platform. And then, since you are operating within unchanged parameters, it costs even more. 
perfect example, our last two aircraft carriers. There were two aircraft carriers we have, and I forget what is the Bush or the Reagan, whatever it is, and they have the exact same number of aircraft on board. They can generate exactly the same number of sorties, and one costs $7 billion and the other $13 billion, while not adding one sortie capability. Why was that? Well, because they had, they did, when you have research and development money and you do not change the configuration, so then you're taking the same thing and you spend a lot of money to get very minor incremental uh, upgrades. In the case of the aircraft carrier, they spent $5 billion to replace the steam catapult with an electromagnetic catapult, $5 billion. And the electromagnetic capital didn't work for a long time. When he got it to work, it wasn't working any better than the steam, steam thing. In other words, if you confine R&D to incremental improvement, you spend a lot of money to get very little. You have to do macro. Macro, that is to say, not a slightly better way of having something, but something, spend your money to achieve complete configuration change. Now, why is that? Why is it different in civilian life? It's completely different for the following reason. Every weapon system you have has evoked countermeasures, has evoked tactical countermeasures, counter weapons, counter sensors, and all that. If you change the configuration with a whole new platform, then you get a countermeasure holiday. You get the period of time until the other side learns how to develop the specific countermeasures. If you remain in incremental improvement and not jumping, then you, you, you don't get the countermeasure holiday. Like when, when, for example, when Israelis were the first to do these, you know, what we call now drones, they used to be called UAVs, then they were before that called RPVs, remotely piloted vehicles. They were the first. Since nobody else had them, they did not have to put data links for information because nobody had any way of intercepting the data. Now, somebody who does the same thing encounters all the countermeasures against them. So macro innovation is to come up with a new configuration, a new platform, so that you get the benefit of the X number of years until they get countermeasures. And that is the difference is very different because one of them is you need uh, obedient institutional people who will to do these incremental improvements. And the other thing you only get when you bring in outsiders. Yeah. Macro means outsiders. So it's very important to have outsiders with ideas should have access because they are the only ones who are going to say, oh, there's a completely different way of doing it. And, I, and there's a series of them. In the, uh, I'll just mention one. There, there's a, a German, a world famous German, world famous expert on explosives. Absolute. Top of the thing. He, and he invented reactive armor. Reactive armor. These boxes that you put on top of armor that pre-detonate bazookas and stuff. So he's, as a top explosive expert, of course, he, he had established relations with Krauss Maffe that makes armored vehicles in Germany. So he goes to them and say, let's put boxes to blow up, to stop bazookas and so on. They told him to get lost. We're not going to pay money to put explosives on our own tanks. He went to the army. The army told me to get lost. So then he picked up the phone and called the Israeli defense officer in the embassy in Bonn, as it then was. And calls him up, and he happened to be a naval officer who knows nothing at all about armor. Naval officer heard what he was saying. He called the chief armor development, the same guy, the disciplined clean boots guy, who developed the Merkava tank all by himself, you know, one man shop. The whole Merkava, this general town, tells him on the phone and decides, call him back, buy him a ticket, I'm waiting for him at the airport tomorrow. This guy, who was a well known scientist, could not get his, you know, the German army even to look at it. He's flown to Israel, and the Israelis had these boxes, put them on the tanks, and all that. He also made a lot of money because eventually the Israelis exported them. And he got a royalty <laughs> on these boxes. <laughs> all right, we have time for just one or two, but Dr. Lobzak may stick around when we're done chatting. Cliff May. The Islamic Republic of Iran has a strategy, your strategist, and the strategy is essentially to use proxies to fight their wars, so that's Hamas. Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, various Shia militias against the Americans. It seems to me that we don't see the list that, that Israel, and certainly the United States, does not have a strategy to defeat this enemy that is waging a war against them. Death to Israel, eventually to be followed by death to 
to America. Constantinople was not destroyed in a day. What would be what strategy would you recommend to both Israel and the United States? Because you you can society. chase the different dogs, or you can go to the owner. Well, right? Uh, and and, and, that and the way to go to the owner is that the owner happens to be an oil exporter. And he has, he has no pipeline. All his exports by tanker. And the thing to do is to wait outside the Straits of Hormuz. Tanker has Iranian oil. You don't let it through. You, you, see, you sell it. You put the whole US Navy in the Persian Gulf not to attack the Iranians at all, but to defend our friends. So you have the US Navy in the Persian Gulf not touching and not attacking, simply protecting our tank, you know, our friends' tanker and serve go smoothly. Their tankers don't reach their okay. and so you Cut off their funds. That's maximum. Yes, because the Israelis can only reach Iran and bomb Iran with nuclear weapons. So the Iranians keep talking about destroying Israel. If they destroy Israel, Tehran, Isfahan, Shiraz, Hamadan, they're all going to burn. So, well, but, but nuclear weapons are too powerful to be useful. The Israelis cannot deter with nuclear weapons any more than poor Putin can get anything from his nuclear weapons. The very they cannot do it. As for conventional bombing, the Israelis can reach and bomb Tehran, but there will be symbolic amounts of, of ordinance, and you couldn't achieve what you want to achieve. So my view is, first, the US government has to be in the business of deterring Iran. They have to do so realistically, not by starting a, a war and all No, simply stopping the tankers. Stopping the tankers, cutting off the entire income, because the Iranian economy is not as flourishing as you might think, and so on. I was in Iran three years ago, and I didn't actually go to, to Iran because my friends were not there. And I tell you, the place is piss poor. I saw people who were standing all day selling a few ducks on the side of the road. Tabriz itself is not the favorite town of the regime because the Azeris and so on, but still pretty miserable. So you cut off the oil funds, they have no funds to give to them because they sell the oil on Monday and they give the money Tuesday to Hezbollah and to the militias in Iraq and Syria and Yemen. So that's the thing to do. We need to have deterrence. We need to have a way of doing it and not by starting a world war, etc., etc. Simply stopping the tankers outside, uh, intercept them well outside the Persian Gulf, but you have to put the whole U.S. Navy in the Gulf to protect our guys. I gotta ask, how was the visa process three years ago? Do you, do you mail the paperwork into the interest section, or how does that? Listen, I don't know that... where you were brought up. I was brought <laughs> up in Palermo, Sicily, uh. okay? So I do not, when I go to countries of that sort, I do not actually use a passport. You know, because, you know, paperwork, paperwork. Yeah, right? it's, it's a pain. However, if anybody doubts my story, which may sound improbable, I actually, you know, uh, I had with me my, my assistant, who is a Japanese lady, and Japanese are well known for taking lots of pictures. She took lots of pictures. <laughs> All right, one last, one last question. Yes, sir. Hi. Since October the 7th, the role of Qatar as an intermediary um, to release hostages and such has been sort of highlighted. And I've been convinced that, you know, we, those of us on the Israel, pro Israel <clears throat> side of things, I think we are maybe too content with like, how is it that this country, how is it that we are okay that they are friends with the terrorists and they can get us a few hostages, yes, which is good, but should it, like, shouldn't, is it, isn't it time for our side of the, the fight to reevaluate how much we tolerate the Qataris and all their shenanigans? So, I forget when it was, but the Saudis asked the US military to leave the soil of the kingdom. They went to Qatar and established a base. That base is a comfortable base. Qatar is on the water. Everything goes fine. And so they accommodate. Then they have, of course, always had Al Jazeera, which is the old Nasserists, the old Arab nationalists, and super anti Western, and everybody. So, so. so don't talk to the Saudis about the Qataris, because the Saudis would like to go there and squash them. Just get rid of them. The whole lot of them. They're, it's a bunch of upstart, out-of-fringe Bedouins. They're, they're so-called royal family. There were people who had, the other guys had one camel, that, you know, that two camels, so they became the ruler, okay? These- <laughs> so Qualitative military The Saudis edge. wanted to sweep them off the board. Okay? What happens is they accommodate the Iranians, they accommodate Hamas. 
They, of course, had the Mossad office in, in Doha a long time. And the people in Doha probably put on weight also. So <laughs> the, uh, they serve everybody. And the Qataris are open to the Israelis. The, I mean, they, they have a Mossad office in, in Doha. You know, and they, they have the Iranians there, the Americans there. And nobody wants to hit them because everybody has the thing. However, you might conclude if, you, if somebody were doing foreign policy in the United States, there may be such a person, I have not heard of him yet, <laughs> they might conclude that the negatives are worse, uh, are worse than the positive. But for example, in regard to cement, the cement of the tunnels was brought into Ashdod port. And who gave permission to bring it in? The Israelis. Who paid for the cement? Qatar. Why was the cement brought in? Well, because these poor Palestinians live in refugee camps, like the Jabalia refugee camp. I've heard about a lot in the last few days. You know, the pictures don't look like a refugee camp. You don't see a single tent there. Maybe there are some kids practicing camping behind one of these apartment houses. But anyway, the Israelis allowed the cement to go in, OK? And the Qataris pay for it, et cetera. So that's the story. All right, Dr. Eber Luftak, thank you for doing this. Congratulations on the book. Thank you, sir. This is a nebulous media production. Find us wherever you get your podcasts.